Generators, here to respond. The defined sacral, the yin that is receptive to what comes from life and is rung like a bell, and either the bell rings or it thuds. If you're a generator, the most important thing for you is to use your life force energy. It's almost as if um, projectors and reflectors, the non-energy types, are here to work with awareness and to here to work with information. But for the energy types, the manifester and the generator, it's about the energy. No amount of information is going to make you use that energy. You can use information all day long. It's about what is your energy used for and how do you use your energy correctly? What is it meant to be used for? You came into this life equipped with this energy that can only be accessed in response. When you walk into a room and say, hey, good morning, you're immediately meeting resistance. When you walk up to the barista and say, hey, I'd like to get your attention here. Would you give me a coffee? you meet resistance. The generator is here to find a way to use their energy correctly, as is the manifester, by the way. The manifester is also an energy type. It's not that the manifester doesn't use their energy. It's just for the manifester to use their energy. It's more about eliminating the resistance to what they're manifesting, to what they're initiating, what they're starting in the world. And so for the manifester, it's much more about how do I eliminate resistance by informing so that I can maximize impact and not have to do this again? The manifester wants to do something once. But the generator does the same thing over and over and over again. Think of the tennis player hitting the ball back. This is the perfect generator. Every time the ball comes, you hit it back. So many generators think that, I don't know, they don't get what they're supposed to do. Like they think that they're ready for something to happen and they're frustrated it's not happening. They're not frustrated that it's not happening. They're frustrated that they keep initiating. They're frustrated that they keep starting new things that fill up their life so there's no space for them to respond. Generators go into shutdown. They go into a mode where they don't answer their texts. They don't answer the phone. They don't respond to people. They leave people on read. They don't respond to life. Now, this is necessary sometimes. We're not going to respond to everything. It's not like generators are here to just respond to everything life brings. But as the generator trusts their sacral energy more, they begin to respond to more and more things. Kind of like the ultimate ideal archetype of the generator would respond to everything. That's what they're here for. But of course, we have to trust our sacral energy, which also means realizing We've forced ourselves, I'm a generator, so I'm, I'm talking about we, we generators have forced ourselves to do so many things we don't want to do that we didn't respond to that our sacral goes into protest and it's like we have no free libido left and the only thing we respond to is doom scrolling or binging Netflix or who knows what, right? I tell the story from Paul Oster's Book of Illusions, so minor spoiler here if you haven't read the book, although this is the very beginning of the book, so... I think um, it's okay, and I, I highly recommend reading it. It's a fantastic book. In the book, you have a, a person who loses his wife and kids, and he's grieving, and he's feeling all of this sorrow, and years are going by, and basically he doesn't respond to anything. He doesn't want to go to parties. He doesn't want to go to work. He gets all this money, so it actually makes it worse. A lot of times, generators think money would solve their problem. Well, in this case, his wife and kids are lost, and he gets a big legal settlement, and it makes it worse because he's not even being forced to work. So he's just sitting around, growing his beard, basically become moss on a rock. He's not responding to anything. Years go by. He won't work. He won't create. He won't write. He won't socialize. He won't do anything. He's frozen in grief. Finally, one night, he laughs. And it's the first time he's laughed since he lost his family. And he laughs watching an old 1920s silent film, kind of a Charlie Chaplin-like character. And that sets a whole sequence of events in motion, which result in the rest of the book. And it's a great book, Book of Illusions by Paul Oster. Highly recommended. But this is an example of what happens when we lose our libido. Libido is life force energy. It's the energy that we invest in things. When we're in a relationship, we invest a lot of libido. When we love someone, we invest a lot of libido. If we lose them, we lose that libido. 
And then we basically have a bank account running in a deficit and we don't even have enough energy maybe sometimes to take a shower. I mean, this is what we call depression, right? We fall into a deep depression. And that's a lack of libido, a lack of interest in life, a lack of appetite. We lose our appetites. Instead of asking someone, how are you? It's nice to ask, how are your appetites now? How are your appetites? Oh, I've lost the appetite for my job. I've lost the appetite for these social things and so on. Where is your appetite going? This is the generator question, right? So when we're in that state of basically sacral shutdown and sacral protest and we have no interest in anything, then only the tiniest little thing will make us respond and then that's what we have to do. We just have to do that one thing. It's like the teenager who just wants to sit in the basement and play video games and the parents are saying, go get a job. And the teenager's like, no, I can't. They don't have the energy to do that. They're only responding to this video game that they play for hours or something like that. And so trusting that no matter how specific that is, that that's a natural step in the healing process, that later that generator will have more energy and they will respond to more. But their sacral was so frustrated for so long that it's kind of like this healing process of allowing themselves Basically, true self-love, you know, allowing yourself to just be and do what it is you actually respond to, even if it seems stupid, even if it seems pointless, even if it's going nowhere, even if you're worried others are going to judge you, right? That's the experiment. And what ends up happening is eventually you do gain more libido, and then pretty soon someone's like, you want to go for a walk? Uh Uh-huh. You have this reaction. Or maybe you're a manifesting generator, you don't make as much sound but maybe you notice yourself getting ready to do something, you notice yourself perk up. I mean, essentially, this is noticing the life force energy and where the life force energy wants to go. For the generator, they have all this energy, but it's locked away. It's like locked away within them and they can't access it. And so many generators think that they're ready for something and they're really not because they are not available to respond to it when it comes and it comes and they miss the opportunity. It's like the generator who wants to be in a relationship and is trying to initiate that relationship, and yet something in their life is waiting to be responded to. It's like we think we're waiting to respond as generators. Actually, life is waiting to be responded to, right? We think we're ready to have the relationship, but actually we haven't cleaned our room or something like that, right? There's some silly little thing that we have to respond to first. It's all about order of operations. The generator wants to get ahead of the next step, and they can't. Even manifesting generators, they want it even more. But, you know, and people talk about how manifesting generators can skip to the end and then go back and stuff like that. Yeah, maybe, but at the end of the day, there's still something about energetic loops that have to be closed and there are natural built-in timings to things and what the waiting is my my friend doc yam says the mind is the only thing that can wait the body doesn't even know what waiting is the body is just living so when we say oh i'm waiting i'm waiting i'm waiting well what are you waiting for the mind can either be waiting for something it's expecting which is not waiting to respond or it can be waiting for something it can never expect which is a state that you can only get to when you have responded and you've allowed yourself to respond and close all the loops and do all of the order of operations things leading up to that. So say I'm waiting for the right partner and I'm like, I'm just going to wait for the partner. That's not waiting to respond because I'm not responding to anything in my life that would create space for that partner. See what I'm saying? So we really have to be careful here when we understand waiting. There are plenty of people who've like, I've been waiting for years. Well, yeah, you've been waiting for your music to take off. You've been waiting to become famous. You've been waiting for something to happen that would allow you to start truly living. But that, that's not what human design is. That's what neurosis is. That's what neurotics do. They wait for their parents to die so that they can truly live without the judgment of their parents interfering. And what human design is saying is stop waiting. Stop waiting so you can start waiting for something else. Stop waiting for your expectations to be met so that you can start waiting for something to happen that you can't predict. And then trust in the decision-making process of your form, whether it's the emotional authority or you're a splenic generator and you get intuitive hits along with your sacral response, or you're just a pure generator like me. If you're a generator, What you're really waiting for is something to come along that then you can decide in that moment uh, or over time, 
you know, that moment kicks off a process of clarity, of coming into focus. And that decision-making process, that's, that's essentially what human design is about, right? Your strategy and authority. That's the real process that we're practicing here. But you can only get there when you stop waiting for your expectations to be fulfilled. And you can only really get there through the surrender of self-love and self-acceptance of really allowing yourself to, to respond to things, first of all, and also allowing yourself to cut out everything that you've obligated yourself to. I mean, it's hard being a generator with a defined ego. I'm lucky I don't have a defined ego because I'm not always promising and committing my willpower to things that my sacral might not respond to later. Um, but of course, undefined egos don't have it much easier because as the not self, they're always over committing too. You can tell you haven't been following your sacral response if you have a sense of dread. Dread is basically, and I don't mean nervousness, that could be the solar plexus. I don't mean fear, that could be in the spleen. I don't mean anxiety, that could be in the ajna. I mean dread. If you have a sense of dread, like in your hara, the hara being this Japanese term for like the point to two finger widths below the belly button. If you have a sense of dread there, you've initiated somewhere. You have committed yourself somewhere. You have promised somewhere, and it's something that your sacral is going uh-uh to or is pulling back from, and yet you're obligated to it. So this is what you can really look for as a generator is when do you have that sense of dread? When do you have that sense of people putting expectations on you? And that shows you that you've kind of taken a wrong turn because you didn't respond to that. If you respond aha uh -huh to something, or if you get the emotional clarity for it, or however your decision-making process works, then you're essentially committed to it, even if it goes wrong, even if nothing comes from it. Something my good friend and business partner, Richard Corbett, likes to say. He's an emotional manifesting generator. He likes to say that if he has come to emotional clarity by giving himself enough time to make a decision, at that point, he has completely let go of the outcome. We went to Burning Man together last year. It took him like a month to decide. But once he decided, the whole time at Burning Man, he was a total champ. It was the year that it got really muddy and had all these problems. He wasn't bothered by it in the slightest. Why? Because his emotional clarity had decided that was the right decision to make. So once that had that happened, it didn't really matter if it was good or bad. It didn't matter if we had a good time or a bad time. It didn't matter if it was fun or if it wasn't fun. It didn't matter if the music was good or bad. It didn't, none of it mattered because the commitment had already been made because the emotional process had gone through its wave and had essentially been able to let go of the outcome. But in times where he'd made a decision in advance, before the emotional wave went through its wave, right? In those cases, then he would be really hoping he'd have a good time, hoping it's a good outcome, hoping it was the right decision. And you can really tell when you've waited long enough for the emotional wave because you just go, okay, I'm now detached from the outcome. And that's what it's like for me as an unemotional, as a pure sacral generator. I only have the 952 and the 2946, so root, sacral, G center. And that's how my decision-making process is. If I commit my energy to something, gate 29, the gate of commitment, right? If I sacrally respond and commit my energy to something, it doesn't matter if I have a good or a bad time because I'm committed to it. It's almost like that frees you to enjoy it so much more. I remember when I was 13 years old, I, I went out with a, a friend of mine. We went to see the movie Kingpin that had just come out in theaters. And uh, really dumb movie, dumb, silly, you know, Fairly Brothers movie. The people that did Dumb and Dumber, you know, that kind of, that kind of, um, it was perfect for a 13-year-old boy. I'll, I'll put it that way. But, you know, we decided up front before we went, he said to me, hey, we should just laugh at every joke. And I was like, yeah, let's laugh at every joke. It was an interesting experiment because some of the jokes weren't funny, but we started laughing at the jokes. By the end of it, we were just in tears. The laughter became authentic. We were free to truly enjoy every joke, even the bad ones, because we'd accepted and surrendered to the commitment up front. It's like that in relationships. If you are truly following your strategy and authority, if you truly get an uh-huh to being in that relationship, or if you've truly gone through your clarity or however it works for you, then when you're in that relationship, no matter what happens, you can laugh at every joke, right? Because you've surrendered and you're no longer guiding the outcome. There's no longer a possibility that some bad outcome would reveal that it was the wrong choice. You know it's the right choice. You know you made the right choice, so you know that whatever that experience is in that relationship is the right experience for you. 
so you can laugh at every joke and you can handle everything that comes along because you're no longer invested in the outcome. That's what human design gives you and that's what it is to be a generator. I'm not saying it doesn't work that way for projectors, manifestors, reflectors, but if you're a generator, honoring that energy and realizing that your commitment of that energy allows you to then surrender and enjoy the ride doesn't get any better than that. It doesn't.